Hi, good evening, everyone. My name is Chi Osei. I'm the first Gen Z elected official in New York State, and I'm the council member representing the 36th Councilmanic District here in Brooklyn, New York, of the neighborhoods of Bed-Stuy and North Crown Heights. Uh, we're here on a panel to talk about Black history, um, and not only Black history, but the future uh, for Black people in the movement as a whole. Uh, we're joined by amazing guests here today, and I want to uh, kick it off with uh, the Linda Sarsour. Linda, could you introduce yourself? Thank you so much uh, for having me here today. So my name again is Linda Sarsour. I am one of the co-founders of Until Freedom. I'm a racial justice and civil rights activist and have been for over 20 years. Um, I've actually dedicated my career to really the liberation of Black people because I believe as a Muslim American, Palestinian American, uh, Arab American from Brooklyn, New York, that my liberation is tied to the freedom and liberation of Black people. So that's kind of my area of focus. That's what I do. I'm working part of, I'm part of a larger and, more, and, and vibrant uh, racial justice movement that is really following the traditions of our civil rights movement. Thank you so much for that introduction, Linda, and thank you so much for being here. Um, it's always a pleasure to hear you speak and sit on panels with you. Um, I also do want to kick it off to attorney Angelo Pinto. Welcome, An Anthony. Angelo, sorry. No, thank you so much for having me. Uh, my name is Angelo Pinto, attorney, activist, organizer, and one of the other co-founders of Untold Freedom, um, along with Linda Sarsour. And last year, we spent the better half of the year advocating for justice for Breonna Taylor, um, where we moved and lived in Louisville, along with a robust kind of plethora of activists, organizers, and frontline folks. Um, and we're just happy to continue to do the work and be a part of the larger movement that, is exist that exists and that has been moving around the country in the fight for Black lives. Angelo, thank you so much for being here. I'm also really excited to hear more from you uh, when we get to the question portion of this panel. Um, and last but not least, we do have Latasha Brown. Latasha, how are you doing this evening? I am doing wonderful. I'm really excited about this discussion. I am Latasha Brown. I'm co-founder of Black Voters Matter Fund and the Southern Black Girls and Women's Consortium. I've been a social justice activist for more than 25 years, close to 27 years. Um, I've dedicated my life for the upliftment and the liberation of Black people in all communities. And I'm also a human rights activist as well, as well as a, a creative and an artist. Wow. Thank you so much for being here as well. Uh, before we jump into questions, I do want to tell each of you that uh, all of you inspire me, you know, as someone that uh, came to the streets before uh, running for elective office, um, I look up to each and every single one of you um, and the work that you provide, uh, not only within your daily lives, but what you attribute to our, our society as a whole. Um, so thank you again for allowing me to be in your presence. Uh, the first question I do have, and um, we'll kick it off with Latasha, is why is this upheaval related to racial and social injustice happening now? You know, I think there's always these moments in time, we have to really recognize that movement, we're in protracted struggle. There's ebbs and flows in movement, but movement is always happening. It is a matter of what are the external circumstances that are happening. And so what we see right now is we see in this nation, we see where there is an intensified kind of racial, um, racial dogmatic kind of dog whistle that, that we're hearing. Um, we're, we're seeing an attack on, on black lives. You know, we're seeing um, an attack on black voting rights. You know, there is an extreme partisan division in this nation. And so I think that the conditions are, are lending itself such that people feel like they've got to respond to it and that we have organized and we've been organizing ourselves. So I think in this moment, what we're seeing is we're seeing at the moment of where opportunity, where the circumstances and that people are making a decision and a choice to respond, to push back. It has been intensified. If we if we pay attention to what has happened in the last five, 10 years, we've seen this concerted effort to marginalize communities of color, to attack every community that is a non-white community. We've seen attack on Muslim, the Muslim community. We've seen attack on the Asian community. We've seen attacks on African-American communities. We've seen attack on poor communities. And so while that's not new to America, what we have seen is we've seen it being intensified and we've seen the justification of that literally become into mainstream. We saw the former administration president that actually was, was aligned himself with white nationalists. And so I think in this moment, what we're seeing is we're seeing communities of color. We're seeing that organizers are building a multiracial, multigenerational coalition of people who are responding and creating a, a, a new paradigm moving forward. 
And Angelo, with your work with Until Freedom, how would you like to respond to that question in terms of uh, the nationwide or some may even see worldwide upheaval uh, related to racial and social injustice? Yeah, I mean, I think the point is well taken that we are always combating, we're always in movement and for social progress. I think at different moments in history, there are events that take place that make the movement more forward facing, that give the movement more visibility, and that also invite big more folks into the movement. I think what we saw in the past few years, which has really been big building since Ferguson, it's been building since Trayvon Martin, is a large opening to invite more folks into the movement and for have more folks recognize that there is something they can do. There was a role for them in social movement. Um, I think oftentimes folks may see the work taking place, they see the movement, they see injustice, and they don't know where they fit or they think they don't fit or they don't see themselves connected to what's taking place. And I think in this moment, um, that is very intense. Mm -hmm. Many folks are recognizing that what's happening is not something that they could not be connected to, something that they could ignore. And people are finding a variety of ways to enter into the movement, whether it's um, starting an organization, becoming a member of an organization, participating in protests, becoming a frontliner. There's this, this plethora of avenues to enter the movement. And I think what's happening is we're seeing the movement grow, we're seeing the movement beco become more visible, and we're seeing the movement become more mainstream where politicians, elected officials, the media can't ignore it, folks are forced to respond to it. And I think in this moment, even though there are certainly some challenges, the movement is gaining a lot of potential and a lot of momentum, and I believe um, if we continue in the direction that we're moving, we will see a lot more change and we'll certainly uncover a lot more challenges. But I think those challenges will lead us to some very important answers. Right. Now, Linda, I know in your work, um, you always advocate for intersectionality uh, within the movement, which leads me to my next question. Um, and, and what did we learn from the movement in the 60s uh, that we can apply to the new movement um, that has been going on for the past couple of years? I appreciate that question, um, Councilman. There's nothing that we do now in the movements of today that we did not learn from the civil rights movement. There's oftentimes people are trying to disconnect us from um, our elders and those that came before us who have been on the front lines. You know, our marching, our petitioning, our direct action, our civil disobedience, our organizing um, around media advocacy. Uh, uplifting stories of individuals who have been harmed by injustice at the hands of the system. Those are all strategies of uh, the civil rights movement, boycotts of corporations, you know, uh, the, the opportunity to have people intergenerationally engage in our movement. That it, these are all tactics of the civil rights movement. When people block traffic, when you we see all these arguments that people say and say, why can't you just be more peaceful like they were in the civil mm -hmm. rights movement, like Dr. King? And we say a lot of the obstacles that we put forth uh, to this injustice system is based on what we have learned from the civil rights movement. And so for me, we've everything we've learned, we are applying. Uh, we have, of course, more tools available to us, you know, in this generation. But everything that we do is a continuation of the tradition of the civil rights movement, which really was about centering black people, black freedom, black civil rights, black human rights, because even in the civil rights movement, when we knew they knew that when black people had voting rights, when black people were able to participate, were able to go into different uh, places of business, when black people had access, that meant that everybody had access. And I will say this about my immigrant parents, if it was not for the civil rights movement, if it was not for black people on the front lines, we would not have been able to change our immigration laws to eliminate quotas. Um, which were, were able to help families like mine immigrate from other parts of the world to find freedom and liberation in America. Now, I, mind you, when they got here, they didn't exactly get what they were sold, but it was on the backs of Black leaders in the civil rights movement. And I'm very grateful to try to continue that tradition and open more opportunities um, for others. Mm -hmm. And Latasha, is there anything that you would like to add to that in terms of what you know, we learned uh, from the, the movement in the 60s. Absolutely. Well, the first thing I did right was the day I started to fight. Yes. Keep your eyes on the prize and hold on. 
hold on. You know, I wanted to to start and 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 sing this song, this freedom song that is from the civil rights movement, because there is the strategy and the skills of movement, but there's the spirit of movement. Mm. And so I think we also have to recognize that part of what we're learning and part of this continuation um, that Linda talked about is really around the spirit of people, that the spirit of the people, we've continued to move this forward. There are many tools that we have different now that we're able to access from social media, the platforms of how we get our story out, how we get our messages out, how we could connect to people in a matter of seconds, hundreds of thousands of people in minutes, right? How we can use our cell phones as cameras to capture some things that are happening to us to also send messages. So there are many tools, the structure, I think, and the and the um, the work, the strategy around the work has not shifted. But I do believe that we have an advantage around each and every generation is building upon the last generation. We can learn from their successes and we can learn from their failures, just as the generation that comes after us, after us will learn as well. So I do believe that part of, I think one of the things to continue to lift up is there's a certain spirit of the movement that can't be broken. And while there are ebbs and flows, I think we're in a moment that we're seeing, we're seeing young people People. We're seeing like we're seeing the largest with the George Floyd uprising. We saw the largest protest ever in the history of this country. I am clear that that came out of the, the legacy of the civil rights movement and those of us who have been organizing and based our organizing model on that model, we've continued to build and build and build. And I think we're at this moment now that we're building a mass movement that's not just in the U.S., but a mass movement that is influencing the world mm -hmm. based on what we've learned, the lessons that we've learned, and the studies that we've done of looking at the leadership from the civil rights movement, the voting, um, the Black Power movement, and other movements that have happened before us. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, and to your point, Latasha, Angelo, what, what new tools do we have at our disposal here in 2022? Um, I remember in 2020, you know, one of the, the key things that I wanted to do when protesting on the streets of New York City was to document um, and create our own narrative uh, because the news outlets were doing us wrong. Um, but what would you like to say about the new tools uh, that we have at our disposal now in 2022 with the movement? I mean, I think one of the tools that we can't ignore that is certainly a new tool, and of course it comes with its pros and its cons, is social media. I mean, we're living in the technological age. We're living in a moment where the digital landscape is evolving and it's given us the ability to one, pay closer attention to what's going on, be connected to what's going on in places, you know, that are out of reach or that not, are not our neighborhood. Um, it's given us the ability to do some organizing with folks, to have these conversations digitally. We all don't have to be in the same room. I mean, I think the other piece that's tremendously useful is the camera. You know, because everyone is walking around with a cell phone, everyone is equipped with a tool that has given them a lot of power, particularly in the face of police violence. Um, and I think particularly even in the face of vigilante violence. So those are some of the tools that I think have transformed the movement and given power to everyday people to say they can do something when a moment is happening, but also they can find the ways to connect to the larger and broader movement. Um, I think of course, it comes with certain hurdles. I think certain individuals now will find themselves exclusively organizing online. And while I think that's important when you see kind of some robust petition platforms and other platforms where tremendous organizing is happening, we still have the need to have folks in the street. We still have the need of having folks actually put their bodies um, on the line in a variety of ways. So I think there's still a lot to be learned in this new landscape and we can't rest exclusively on these digital tools mm -hmm. and this technology to do this work. I think some of the, the old spirit of the movement still must be intact as we utilize these new tools. And I think together, when you put those things together, it's a recipe for success. Um, mm -hmm. I think we still have some room to grow, but I think the tools have certainly been useful in this moment. Mm -hmm. And Linda, what other pitfalls do you think exist because of the new tools that we have at our disposal? You know, before I get to the pitfalls, I wanted to say something else about, you know, social media and citizen journalism mm -hmm. uh, and that and how important that has been to the movement, because it actually has created competition between, uh, you know, kind of traditional media and those in the movement that use their cameras to tell the stories of what actually is happening on the ground. And oftentimes those with the cameras have helped to 
defend what truly is happening on the ground. Uh, you know, when we have major platforms like CNN and others showing when there are, uh, you know, a few very small minority of people that may be engaging in, you know, throwing a bottle or, you know, tipping over a, a garbage right. can or, you know, you know, burning a tree or whatever it is. And then when we know that the majority of protests for those of us who are on the ground know that the majority of these protests are uh, nonviolent and in the tradition of the civil rights movement, which was mm -hmm. oftentimes rooted in nonviolent. So citizen journalism is powerful. It's powerful in New York, but it's also powerful in revolutions that are happening all across the world, in Sudan, in Yemen, in, you know, in, in Syria, in Palestine, and everywhere you see there that there's people rising up against injustice. Uh, citizen journalists have now been at the center of telling a story that really comes and is authentic as an unfiltered from, um, you know, from major media sources uh, mm -hmm. or ma media platform. And now, pitfalls. And I think Angelo talked about some of these oftentimes, you know, social media influencers who are not people who are on the ground, they are important, they help to amplify and put stories out. But sometimes they get centered instead of the people who are actually on the ground, the people who are actually sacrificing their lives, the people who are actually on the front lines, really defending their community, or in that case, fighting for, you know, a local a person who has been murdered by police or vigilante. And so we need to be careful that um, as we are amplifying the voices of others around the country, especially super, you know, grassroots organizers, that we are able to ensure that they are, that our platform is about giving them voice. It's about telling their story. Um, it's about making sure that we're directing people to them as well, because they too are experts. They are on the front lines. They know what the fight is ahead of them in their localities, because this fight is not just a national fight. This fight is small fights that are happening all across the country. And, you know, it is our responsibility to make sure that those people are heard. So that's one pitfall um, of the, the, and social media is also, as you know, rumors start, things spread fast. So we want to make sure also when we're sharing information uh, about what's happening um, on the ground, that we're being accurate that we're checking and we're confirming information because we don't also want to, uh, you know, contribute to harm. Like, for mm -hmm. example, as you know, in our immigrant rights movement, sometimes people will share things like, oh, don't go to the street corner because ICE agents are about to pick people up or they're doing some sort of search. Mm -hmm. And if that's not true, we're putting fear and terrorizing people when that's absolutely unnecessary. So right. we have to be, you know, responsible as we use tools like social media. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Now, Latasha, with being co-founder of Black Voters Matter, um, I truly believe that you are a living, breathing example of this next question. But uh, for those of us that aren't, uh, what can each of us do in our daily lives to fight the various injustices um, that Black people face, that BIPOC people face, that people of color face? You know, I, there's three quick things that I'll say. The first thing is we. this is not a moment that you can stay on the sidelines. This isn't a moment that you can be an observer. The bottom line is what we're doing in this moment, if we are ever to have the nation that we desire and we deserve, it is going to require every single one of us to actually put, we need all hands on deck. And I think in this particular moment, this is a defining moment. We have to know what time it is. The time it is right now that there's, I think there's a realignment all across um, this nation that we, this is an opportunity for not us for us to to push back. The bottom line is we're seeing this massive attack on voting rights. We're seeing this massive attack on social movements right now. But not because we're losing, we're winning. It's working, and so this is a moment for us. As I, I often say, we got to go hard in the pain. And what that's going to require is a couple of things. I'll just say three quick things. The first thing, everybody should have a political home. Is you know, it's, it's something that that Linda said around being able to filter information, how we share information, but also how we create our own political ideologies. It should be in community with people so that we're not just speaking out of a vacuum or we're saying because we saw an article on Twitter or Facebook or, or IG, but that we are all, we're forming our political beliefs based on community, based on information, being informed by those that we work, we live, we love, and we learn from. And so I think it's really important for us, one, Every single person should find a political home. It doesn't matter if it's an organization, you can join an organization, volunteer as a part of a group. It can be a civic organization, NAACP, until freedom, but you need a political home. You need a community that can actually, you can be in communication with, you can be in touch with to help shape your political ideologies and your beliefs. The second thing is we actually got to serve in this moment that to really recognize in order to have a robust democracy, it is going to require all of us engaging. Part of the reason why those in power have been able to abuse 
uh, have been able to abuse resources, have been able to abuse public policy, because half the population in this country is not engaged um, in, in the electoral process. Not that I believe that voting is the end all and the be all, but I certainly believe that voting is one vehicle to reduce the harm happening in our community. It does make a difference around what DA is in office and, and who that DA feels accountable to. It makes a it makes a, a critical difference when someone is in office that is either going to work against your community or, or at least align with your community. And in order to hold them accountable, we've got to show up and show out. So the second thing is we literally have to be able to recognize electoral power is a form of power for us. So that means that if you're not registered to vote, you need to register to vote. You also need to engage people around you in registering to vote. We have to make sure that we're a part of this process. If people are making decisions about us and our families, we have to be a part of that process. The third thing, too, I think is really important, and it goes back to Linda's point as well. We really have to educate our, ourselves in this moment about really what's happening and what's going on. That means that we're going to have to be students. We're going to have to be students of the movement. We're going to have to really be able to seek for information mm -hmm. so we can get information to share around how we're going to advance our communities and think of ourselves not just as citizens of America. Mm -hmm. We should think of ourselves as founders of a new America, which requires us to be visionaries. So we've got to push it beyond what we see already right now. We've got to literally demand something greater. And in order to do that, we've got to have a vision. We've got to have some power league that we're using. And we've got to be grounded in real political ideology and theory that is really about the collective advancing and not just an isolation of an idea or a thought. Mm -hmm. and, and Angelo, uh, how can we get a new generation to engage and become active in the fight to overcome social injustices? Mm. I think they're already engaged. You know, when we were on the ground in Louisville, Kentucky, and, you know, of course, on the front lines, even in Minneapolis, one of the things we saw was that there was a new crop of mm -hmm. young people, some young people who have been system involved, some young people who are in high school, some young people who didn't finish high school, mm -hmm. um, some young people who were fresh out of foster care, who decided that this was something that they were not going to stand by and watch and that they were going to get on the front lines and put their bodies and lives on the line for struggle. Um, to confront the police, to confront what they believe were, was injustice. Um, and for me, you know, most of what we saw was actually young folks on the front line. So to me, the next generation is here. The next generation is eager. And I believe it is now our responsibility, some of the folks who are more seasoned, some of the elders in the movement who've been around for a while, who've learned some things, to make sure we're mindful and take these new young folks under the wing because, you know, it's not easy to get on the front line um, and being on the front line doesn't in and of itself make you a strategist, um, help you understand all the intricacies of the movement, but it's, it is something that is essential. Mm -hmm. And for me, when I see young folks who have emerged as leaders and taken to the front line, it also speaks to me um, that these are the new crop of individuals that we need to be intentional about nurturing and making sure they are moving further into their leadership to occupy new spaces and places that can really create transformation. Um, and for me, and I say this all the time, whether it's in a high school or a college, it's really peers that educate peers. So That's to the degree that we want more young people involved in the movement, to the degree that we actually need your, more young people involved in the movement, we need the young leaders standing at the forefront talking about what they've done and inviting them in to participate in this struggle. And I think that's how you get it done. I think many of the young people have done it on their own um, because they've resisted, because they're brave, because they realize something is wrong um, and we're not willing to be bystanders as Linda's book states. Um, but I think now it's our responsibility to hold them up, to nurture them and push them into positions of leadership that really open the floodgates for the next generation to really get involved and take things, you know, take the bull by its horns. Mm -hmm. I completely agree. I do believe that young people are involved and I really, you know, enjoy seeing my generation utilize the tools at hand uh, to tackle this movement. I'm touching on some of the other points that we've heard in the past. Uh, Linda, I saved this question for you, but um, how do you think our current administration is doing? Do you think they're doing enough? Um, and if not, how do you think we could get them to do what's necessary to correct these issues? I don't know why you're trying to get me started, Chief. <laughs> <laughs> 
before I get to that, I will say, um, you know, another tool that we have and ways people can engage is to be inspired by you, Councilman, to 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 follow in your footsteps, to understand that it doesn't right. matter how young you are or what identities you hold. You can be in a position of power. You can run for office. You can run for school board. You can be on your local community board. You can run for city council, for state senate. You know, you could run for Congress. You could mm -hmm. you might not be able to run for president yet as a young right. person. <laughs> time for that. So, you know, running for office uh, for me is really important because if, you know, we can't keep waiting for everybody else to do what needs to be done, we know what needs to be done. So we need absolutely. to make sure our people are running. Is this current administration doing enough? Um, absolutely not. Um, mm -hmm. I am so disappointed um, in this administration. And to be clear, I was never a supporter of this administration. I never, you know, um, uh, you know, I wasn't uh, supporting Joe Biden during the primaries. But of course, I knew that I had to get in line for the general election. I knew that our people could no longer live under a Trump administration. But as we've been under this administration for now over a year, I'm starting to see uh, the, 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 the many kind of mistakes that have been made, um, the many opportunities that have been missed uh, by this administration. I think a lot of times uh, people in power underestimate what we know as a people. Um, and, 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 you know, they've told us, oh, we're going to be the majority get us these two seats in Georgia and we're going to make things happen. We're going to make criminal justice reform happen. And we're going to make, you know, immigrant immigration reform happen. And we're going to do, and, oh, I got you on student debt. I'm not going to be able to eliminate it all, but I'll do something. You know, there was a lot of promises that were made um, during uh, the campaign. And unfortunately, those major promises to our communities have not been fulfilled. And I will say also, even on the fight for voting rights, um, it took until January, which was many, many, many months that, Latasha and Angelo and I and many others have been on the front lines uh, to fight for voting rights, um, whether it be in Washington, D.C. or some of these states like West Virginia, Arizona and mm -hmm. other parts of the South. You know, our president decided that in January he wanted to show up in Georgia. Um, why are you showing up in Georgia to fight for voting rights? The people of Georgia know about voting rights. They know how to go to the polls. They mm -hmm. are the ones that helped us win those seats um, back in January uh, that we needed in order to become the, quote, majority um, and start pushing real legislation mm -hmm. forward. Now, our president should have went to Arizona. He should have been able to go to West Virginia and get his Democrats in line that are the mm -hmm. ones that have been our opposition, uh, especially in this fight for voting rights. There's a lot of talk about who the opposition is. You know, are the mm -hmm. Republicans always our opposition? And we know this, Chief. We have to be honest and we have to have an honest conversation that our opposition is not just the Republicans. There are people mm -hmm. who are neoliberal Democrats and others mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. understand the importance of maintaining power. When we think about student debt, who is the largest group that is impacted by student debt? Black women. Black Who women. gets impacted by voter suppression? Black people. And so it is important that we understand that these issues that we're talking about um, are important. Even when we talk about the Muslim ban, it wasn't just the Muslim ban. It was the Muslim and African ban. We were putting African nations on mm -hmm. the ban list. And remember, that was upheld by this current conservative Supreme Court. So now any president mm -hmm. in the future can deny the rights of people to come to America based on their ethnic or national origin. And this president, while he rescinded the Muslim and African ban, there are still families today that are still separated because this uh, administration put pen to paper, but they didn't have no implementation plan. So I'm very disappointed. And I know that this president has executive power and he can use executive power because we've seen it happen under other administrations. So I'm not a fan um, and I'm hoping that something changes very quickly. Nothing but facts as expected. <laughs> and Latasha, you know, as someone that has energized black voters to, you know, get out and, and vote for, um, you know, this new administration. How do you feel like the new administration is doing? You know, I, I want to um, I, I support everything that Linda just said, but I actually mm -hmm. want to step back for a second because I also believe that we've got to shift. Our, our paradigm mm -hmm. of recognizing that voting is really around, it's a strategy and it's actually a harm reduction strategy. The truth mm -hmm. of the matter is we all know, you know, we all know that this administration, uh, the challenges in this administration, we mm -hmm. all know that literally traditional politics, part of the reason why people mm -hmm. have engaged and disengaged because they often feel that we're not getting what we know that we're not getting. We're seeing the inequities in our community as it relates to other communities, right? Mm -hmm. And so when I think about voting, I think of voting not as a means in itself. Mm -hmm. I think into, as a means to an end. The bottom line is this isn't even about politics. This is about power. 
-hmm. We have to call this out what we're fighting for right mm -hmm. now. Right now, this is about power. This is about the changing of the guard. This nation is becoming younger. It is becoming more diverse. It's becoming browner. And there is a resistance that has been literally lifted up that mm -hmm. has been structurally throughout every single system, throughout both political parties that upholds and literally has pr promoted um, white male leadership. That's just mm -hmm. the, that's that's just been the structure in this country of white supremacy patriarchy. Mm -hmm. And so now what we're seeing this resistance that we're just seeing around from voting rights and those other things. This isn't just about we, we can't just get caught up in the paradigm that this is a party mm -hmm. fight. No, mm -hmm. this is a power fight. Mm -hmm. And so we have to really be able to be strategic to recognize that it's going to take a couple of things for us. Really, it is going to take just as Linda said earlier, we need young people. Young people all across this nation should be challenging leadership, should be challenging and going for these, particularly for, for these offices when we're talking about school board, um, county commission, um, city council um, seats. They should, uh, should actually be competitive for those seats. Why? Mm -hmm. Because this is the first generation. I'm from Generation X, and we didn't have the numbers. The baby boomers, uh, which the, the current president, and my parents, the baby boomers have dominated the political landscape for the last 40 years. This is the first time that now who has eclipsed the baby boomers are generation of the millennials and below. That finally there is a voting base in this nation that is younger, that is more progressive and browner. And we have to really be able to use that power. Power concedes nothing without demand. If there's something that we, if we want to see, we're going to have to organize ourselves one, to have build a pipeline of leadership so that we have progressive leaders that have, that are visionaries, that, that represent their communities and actually are pro-democracy and they're pro-progressive policies. Mm -hmm. The second thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have, instead of us, like literally, though, and I know there, there are a lot of folks who don't do, don't do the work mm -hmm. and, real, and are saying, oh, you know, I just don't believe and I don't engage in the process. The bottom line is, it's like if you have a, a basketball game, somebody's going to win the game. The question is, are you going to be in the game or not, right? Mm -hmm. Because, And if you're going to get on the floor to try to really be able to win for your team. So mm -hmm. ultimately, what we have to do is become really sophisticated as we're looking at these issues, as we're looking at going forward. What is the best strategy, number one, to reduce the harm in our community? Two, how are we building a pipeline that if we want to see change, we're putting ourselves in the best position to seek that change? And three, how are we actually digging in that we have this vision if that we want something different, we're actually putting our cards on the table to get that and really be able to manifest that what, what we see and what mm -hmm. we desire. Absolutely. And, and Angelo, how, how do you think we could get this current administration to do what's necessary in the fight mm. to, 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 to get what we wanted uh, when we voted this man in? You know, I, I, I'm not impressed and I'm not um, <laughs> a fan of this new administration at all. Um, and I wasn't a fan or I didn't think they were going to do the right thing to begin with. But I knew we had someone in office who we couldn't allow to stay in office. Um, and I think the sad part about it, when I think about the Biden administration, and it's not the Biden administration, we have many administrations on both sides of the aisle that have that have told us they were going to do many things that mm -hmm. just did not come to light. So this is not anything new. So for me, one of the challenges that is that folks have done so much. Mm -hmm. Folks have told the Biden administration what they want. Folks have right. went to Georgia and traveled around the country mm -hmm. to push folks to the polls. Individuals have organized. They've taken to the streets. They've done all the things necessary. They've written proposals. They've told the party what the agenda is. People have tried to cover all the bases and the administration still does not deliver. For me, when I see that happening, I think it's challenging. I think it may be, um, it's not right to tell folks to do more, mm -hmm. right? To tell folks, hey, figure it out. The, the, the administration is not doing right. What can you do? What are we going to do to make them do the right thing? Mm -hmm. For me, I think we have to start to redefine what winning is. Mm -hmm. And we need to take a whole new strategy and whole new approach to confronting the existing political system because the ways in which we've confronted it, the ways in which our relationship exists with the existing political system, they know exactly how it works. Mm -hmm. They push us to vote, we come out and vote. They don't deliver what we want and then they tell us we have to work harder to get what 
we want. Mm -hmm. We have to do more to get what we want. And for me, I don't think we're in a position um, to tell folks to do more. While I think we could always do more, I think we need to redefine and reestablish our relationship with the mm -hmm. variety of political mechanisms and political apparatus that exist. Mm -hmm. um, I think we need to push back against the Democratic Party as much as we push back against the Republican Party. I think we need to redefine our relationship with the Democratic Party, both local and at a national level. And I think some of the conversations around folks' lack of willingness to vote mm -hmm. is creating an opening for us to say, what are the new strategies? Mm -hmm. What are the new ways in which we need to win so that we're not replicating the same relationship with an administration in power mm -hmm. next year, in the next four years, in the next eight years? So mm -hmm. I think we're on the, I think our tension I, th I think our anger, I think our mistrust is opening a window of opportunity where we're saying, and I think where younger folks in particular are saying, we need something different, we must do something different, and we must change kind of the game that we're playing. We mm -hmm. can no longer look at the Democrats getting in office as a win. We can no longer look at uh, a democratic administration as going to deliver what we want. We could also no longer view us pushing back against a democratic administration as the tools and tactics necessary to deliver what we want. Mm -hmm. So I think this conversation that's, that's emerging, the conflict that's emerging around what we do ha is fertile soil mm -hmm. for some solutions and some strategies that are new. Um, I think, you know, this year is the 50th anniversary of the first black political convention that happened in Gary, Indiana um, in 1972. And mm -hmm. at that time, they asked many of the same questions. They said the party, neither party's delivering. They said this 50 years ago. They said we need a black agenda 50 years ago. They said maybe we need to run a black political candidate 50 years ago. Mm -hmm. So 50 years ago, black folks grappled with the exact same challenges that they're facing now. And we, in many ways... Folks have done a lot of work. I think folks have pushed the envelope in a lot of ways and moved the, the needle. But in many ways, we are asking and engaging in the same fight 50 years later. I think we can't, afford, we can't afford to do that in the next 50 years. We really can't afford to do it in the next five. So I think old leadership has to sit down with young leadership and figure out what the new way forward is. We have to identify some new wins and we got to go after them. Mm -hmm. Well, it seems like we're all in the same boat. President Joe Biden, if you're watching or if you have a staff or watching or listening, do better or at least do something. <laughs> OK, so to Linda, do you believe mainstream media and companies pushing Black Lives Matter and other messaging is helping or muddying the message around the fight for our freedom? That's a really interesting uh, question, Chi, and it's actually been a bit controversial in our larger movements. And I just mm -hmm. want to make it really clear that, uh, you know, corporations are making money off of our communities. They make money off of black consumers. And if they're going to push kind of this racial justice, Black Lives Matter messaging, um, because it is smart for corporations mm -hmm. to do that. They better be putting millions and millions of dollars and investing that in black led organizing in schools, in education, in marginalized communities. And so I always say to people all the time, our people are struggling, so we can't be too self-righteous in these moments. So as long as we're not allowing corporations to co-opt our movements, you know, to co-opt our messaging, to tell us, you know, to dictate how we say things and when we say things and how far we go with our messaging, mm -hmm. I think that corporations do have a responsibility to invest in our community. So a lot of these grassroots organizations who take grants from like Target and other kind mm -hmm. of local uh, corporations and companies, that's important to them. It's important to their programming and to their work. Um, so as long as we're not allowing these corporations to dictate, um, you know, our movement and the way that we decide to strategize and what tactics that we use, I generally um, feel comfortable. Now, mind you, there are corporations who, let's be mm -hmm. clear, are funding, uh, you know, private prisons or investing in private prisons or right. investing in fossil fuel industry or investing in things that harm our people. Those need to be looked at or, or, or corporations that are, you know, against unionization of their workers or corporations mm. that, 
you know, are engaging in things that harm our people. So we need to be clear and do our research and make sure that we're not giving up too much of our principles and values, um, mm -hmm. you know, as we engage with these corporations. I think it's important for people in our movements to go to these Fortune 500 companies and talk mm -hmm. to staff about racial justice and how to be anti-racist. It's not enough to do diversity, equity, mm -hmm. and inclusion. How how does it how can a corporation actually become anti-racist? And I know mm -hmm. this is, you know, again, it's complicated. It's not simple. Some activists will tell you, absolutely not. I don't want to hear nothing about nothing that has to, to do anything with corporations. But I always say to people, let's look at it from the perspective of local organizations on the ground who are running after school programs, who are trying to get our kids off the streets, who are mm -hmm. doing uh, gun violence prevention work um, that don't have the same resources as mm -hmm. some of our national organizations do. So I always try to be a bit more nuanced um, mm -hmm. in this conversation around uh, you know, mainstream media and corporations. But I will say also support when it comes to the media, there are as black media, support black media. We have people like Roland Martin and Roland Martin Unfiltered. And we have uh, the Black News Channel. We have other places where there are black journalists and and black, um, you know, bloggers. And we have The Root and we have others, you know, making sure that we're also giving them stories and that we're working with them on exclusives and making sure that they too are, um, are, are being given the opportunity to write about um, our movements and other, you know, people of color and women of color who are on the front lines, uh, who are with us often in the movements, side by side, making sure that they're telling our story the right mm -hmm. way. So we have a responsibility to support those who have been, um, you know, invested in telling our story the way it needs to be told. Mm -hmm. And Latasha, what do you think of that? I, um, I, I think that it's a, it's a, it's a, I, I ditto what Linda said, but I also think we have to be honest about what, I think sometimes we're not really clear about what we're fighting against. What mm -hmm. we are fighting against is structural racism. Mm -hmm. It's not just a political party. It's not a candidate. It mm -hmm. is embedded in every single system in this nation. Mm -hmm. And so if we're really serious about we mm -hmm. want to have change. And we've got to really think around what it means to build a nation that is not rooted in racism. Mm -hmm. That means what does it mean for us to really recognize that we've got to do two things. The truth mm -hmm. of the matter is right now, the systems that we have in place are impacting our people. We cannot afford to say, well, I don't believe in those systems, so I'm not going to engage. Mm -hmm. The bottom line, we have to see that's a harm reduction strategy. I have to vote. I have to engage in the process because mm -hmm. every bit of power that's on the table, I can't leave anything on the table. Mm -hmm. I've got to engage with those folks who are creating jobs that are located in our communities, that are creating, uh, that are actually influencing policy that impacts my community. With, uh, and so I, we've got to have engagement in that as a harm reduction strategy. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, we also have to have this dual strategy of how do we look at economic opportunity in a different way? How do we look at companies that are literally rooted in this whole notion of how, how about humanity, the value mm -hmm. of humanity? How do we literally shut down companies that are creating harm, that are creating issues around environmental injustice? How do we literally hold them accountable, even shut them down? I think we really have to think about this is a longer conversation that we have to have and a longer strategy, but we have to recognize that we're on a two track strategy. There's an immediate need right now. And that's why I agree with what Linda said, that we've got to engage all parties because the bottom line is they're here and they're impacting our lives and there's no need for us to act like they're not right and so we've got to have some engagement around that at the very least at the very least to reduce the harm happening to our people but mm -hmm. we can't just stop there we also have to spend some time right which is why i love what angelo said i think we have to spend some time thinking about having a radical reimagination of every single system in this country but we got to be really strategic strategic and honest about it, mm -hmm. right? Instead of saying, as someone who started the third party, right? Mm -hmm. Who had literally understood and went through the process, helped start a third party and went through the process, I can tell you the challenges around with that mm -hmm. and can tell you around what we need to do if we're really serious about what it's going to take for us. If we're going to make transform transformative change, it is going to require us to think differently. It's going to require us to even give up some of the things that, that mm -hmm. we see as normal and in, in this moment. But I do believe, and I already think that things are, cha are changing. That mm -hmm. at the end of the day, some of the things that, even some of the things that Angelo raised, the bottom line is things are not the same, 
We can say that things are from the 60s. No, they're not. Like, I am from Alabama. And this, my, my mother couldn't go to a high school, couldn't travel freely. My family couldn't do that. My family couldn't even live where they want to live. The bottom line, things have, have shifted. And they've shifted because people have stood in the space. And our goal is to push it even further and to push it even for, further. And the idea is that we've got to transform every single system in this country. But it is going to require us doing some work. It's going to require us actually getting together, literally building this broad-based coalition and deciding of what are the kind of systems that we're going to create, that we're going to lead, that we're going to put in practice. It is going to be up to us, not for us to wait until other people decide that they're going to change. We've got to be the change that we see. Mm -hmm. That's right. mm -hmm. And and for the last question, I, I do want us to talk about the history, the future of, of, of Black people and Black Black, black, black future um, in terms of the leaders of the future. And I wanna ask um, each and every single one of you, um, and this can be a, a lightning round about who do you consider as the leaders of uh, the new movement? Um, Angelo, can we start with you? You know, I think there are so many, and I love, you know, what the movement now says, and we talk about having a leader full movement, because I think we do. I think when you look at, um, council folks like yourselves, elected officials like yourself who are coming to the forefront, young elected officials who are putting themselves on the line. I think when you look at organizations like Until Freedom, um, there are we are in a moment where we have a leaderful movement. But one of the things that I always look to, you know, my daughter is 10 years old mm -hmm. and she has, you know, been on the front line at protests. She talks to me about when Breonna Taylor was murdered, George Floyd. So she's very tuned in and young folks are hyper aware of what's taking place. Mm -hmm. And I believe that group of young people, and I think every generation that emerges, forces folks to go further. I think the generation, my generation, looked at some of the progress made at the generations before and said, thank you, but it wasn't enough. And it wasn't that we were saying it wasn't enough because we were trying to be, you know, oppositional to our elders, but we were saying it wasn't enough because of the real lived experiences that we were having. Um, and to Latasha's point, mm -hmm. we were realizing that racism and structural racism was still wreaking havoc on our lives. Mm -hmm. So for me, you know, my, my daughter in many ways is the leader that I look to now. She's the person who tells me my school's racist. <laughs> my teachers are racist. And in many ways, even a person who does this work, I'm shocked when she says it. I'm just like, wow. The mm -hmm. young people are becoming hyper aware. They're not willing to pull any punches. And they recognize that the, they probably cannot compromise with the system. And mm -hmm. I think in many ways for too long, and I think even still, we're trying to compromise with a system that not only will not compromise with us, but a system that is so steeped in, in white supremacy that it is going to destroy us. And in many ways is even despite our best efforts. So for me, the young folks who, you know, the two K's of the world who me and Linda met on the front lines of Louisville, Kentucky, the young people who are full of fire, the young people who are recognizing that we need to be sitting in, we need to experience the next American revolution. Those are the folks who I look to as young folks who are not willing to see the system stand as it does and really will make the system fall and be responsive by any means necessary. I think we have to return to that kind of strategy to say that black folks need liberation, black folks need integrity and honor immediately. And a system that is going to force us to wait longer, a system that is going to tell us, you know, next electoral cycle, a system that is going to keep pushing us from that goal line is a system that can't stand. And I think the young people are so steeped in the spirit of resistance that they have the energy to topple it. So those are the folks who I'm looking to and looking at in this moment. Wow. Well, that closes tonight's panel. I want to thank each and every single one of you for um, all of your insightful uh, takes on the various questions that we had here tonight. Linda Sarsour, uh, attorney Angelo Pinto, Latasha Brown, thank you so much uh, for being here this evening. I feel reinvigorated. I feel ready to fight. Um, I know there's a long road ahead. Um, as Angelo said before, we've been doing this for decades, if not centuries. Um, but as long as we are uh, you know, moving through society and through this world, like each and every single one of you, 
uh, with these sentiments, with these answers, and with this, uh, you know, vigor to continue fighting. Um, I believe that liberation is still on the horizon. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you, everyone.